This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on derivatives and the learning module on valuing a derivative using a one period binomial model. We're at the very end of these 10 learning modules under the topic of derivatives, and we're gonna end on a high note. In fact, I think we're gonna end on a super high note. What we're gonna do is value a derivative. We're gonna, we're gonna price a call option, and we'll do a put option uh, as well using this one period binomial model. And the good news for you guys is that we're gonna do this two ways. We're first gonna look at the long way, and then we're gonna look at a shorter version of determining the price of a call option. But the even greater news is that after you get through level one, we're gonna extend this to a two period binomial model in level two, and then the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. And I promise you, once you master all of these models, you're gonna feel like you threw the winning touchdown pass uh, in a Super Bowl. I've said this before, the good thing about these shorter learning modules is fewer LOSs. So really these two LOSs are almost uh, identical, although they don't sound like they are, but we're gonna, we're gonna value a derivative. That's, that's the key LOS here uh, in this learning module. So we're gonna go ahead and start with this one period binomial model. Go ahead and look at the black line underneath the two red arrows, time period zero, time period one. That makes perfect sense, right? One period binomial model. Over on the left-hand side of the two red arrows is the notation for the spot price today. And in most cases, and in this, this learning module, that's gonna be uh, the stock price. So the underlying asset is a share of stock. So this binomial model is super simple in the simple fact that it just assumes that the stock price could either go up or it can go down. So notice at the end of time period one, there is the stock price at time period one, there's the subscript one, but notice there's a superscript of a U and a D. And so that just means up and down. So what we're saying is that the stock price today is some number, let's suppose it's 100, and uh, one period from today, it might be 110 or it might be 90. That would be an increase or a decrease of 10%. Now, what we're gonna learn uh, especially in level two and in level three, when we move on from the one period binomial model, is that implicit in those upward and downward movements is a measure of volatility. I mean, what did I say just a moment ago? What did I say, 110 and 90? Suppose that the stock price today were 100, and a year from now, we thought the price could be 150 or 50. You see there's m way more volatility in my second example than in the first example. And so this binomial model is going to account for that extra, extra volatility. Now I did say this in the introduction that we're gonna first do this the long way. Uh, and I'm guessing that some of you are thinking to yourselves, you know what, this binomial model is way too difficult. I'm just gonna go ahead and skip it, but I'll go ahead and listen to see what Jim has to say, but I promise you that's not really the good attitude. Uh, the binomial model is super simple and I'm going to explain it to you so that you can master this so you have an advantage over all those candidates who, who skip over this topic. But one of the things that we're doing here in this long way is that we're going to be able to ignore the probabilities. So notice on the two red arrows, we have a probability Q of an upward movement, which means and implies that there has to be a probability of one minus Q of a downward movement. Now we can rely on some ancient math. Notice we have the Bernoulli trial in parentheses over there to ignore those probabilities, uh, at least in this early uh, long method. We'll go ahead and talk about probabilities in the shorter method at the end of this slide deck. But for now, let's go ahead and just assume that we have a probability of an upward movement of Q and a probability of a downward movement of one minus Q. We really don't need to worry about what those probabilities are uh, for this particular part of the model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and compute 
the expected stock price with an upward movement and a downward movement. Now, I was curious as I looked through this reading in all the academic research, in all textbooks, um, they use the notation U and D, U for an upward movement, D for a downward movement, but this learning module uses the notation that you see over there by the red and yellow teardrops, gross returns, and then a superscript U for up, of course, gross returns, and then a superscript D for uh, a downward movement. And these are just one plus the rate of return. So what was my example earlier? 110. So the gross return would be 1.1. 1, .1. 1 plus the decimal form of that upward return. And then what did I say? $90. So then the R superscript D would be 0 0.9. Does what I was saying earlier. Look at that first teardrop point. We do not need the probabilities Q and 1 minus Q. All we need are those expectations for gross returns. And then look at that indented teardrop point. This is what I was saying earlier about the volatility that S1 superscript U and D, that's going to determine the volatility to the underlying asset, which of course plays a huge role in how much we're willing to pay for a call or a put option. Now here's where it gets interesting. So all we've done to this point is model stock price path paths. We said, here's stock price today. What did I say? 100. Tomorrow could be 110 or it could be 90. Well, now let's go ahead and layer that share of stock with a call option. So look up at the top arrow point. Consider a one-year call option on this underlying stock with an exercise price of X. So now we have over on the right-hand side of those red arrows, we have not only what that stock price is going to be, in my example, 190, but now right below it, we have what is the possible value of those call options at the expiration date of the option. Now we've relied on this over the past nine learning modules. So when you look at the notation C subscript one, and then with the superscript U, you shouldn't be surprised to see, okay, the option at expiration could finish out of the money. So there's the zero and the option could finish in the money. And there's the comma, the upward stock price movement minus the, uh, minus the exercise price of the option. And the same thing holds true if the stock price goes down. Now, what I will say to you in that in my whole lifetime, you know, this is 30 years or so of me creating uh, questions for investments at both the graduate and undergraduate level. And of course, all the questions that I've written for uh, CFA stuff over the years is that almost always in the one period model, when we have the up movement, that option will finish in the money. When we have the down movement, that option will finish out of the money. And that's going to be important as we work through the math through both the long way and the shortcut as we go through uh, the end of this slide deck. So here's a little summary of the green box and the red box down at the bottom of what I was saying. Call option in the money, call option is out of the money. And so those are, uh, and the, the second checkpoint, those are intrinsic values of the option when it expires. If it's in the money, it has some intrinsic value, right? When it's out of the money, it has no intrinsic value. And of course, at expiration, uh, neither uh, has any time value. All right, so let's take a pause before we go ahead and actually value this option to remind ourselves of all the stuff that we've been learning uh, in all of these learning modules. We talked about replication. We talked about synthetically creating the payoffs. And we talked about the importance of no arbitrage pricing. So I'm going to ask you to pause and remember everything that I said to you in those previous nine recordings about replication and no arbitrage pricing. I'm not going to go ahead and repeat all that stuff right now. Just suffice it to say that all we're doing is we're saying something like, hey, you know what? There's stuff going on here and there's stuff going on here. And what we can do is we can replicate. We can replicate the stuff going on here with stuff going on over here, you know, like the stock market and the options market. 
And of course, uh, let me just quickly remind you that no arbitrage simply means that there's nobody out there who's willing and able to sustainably lose money every single time they trade, which is pretty much a requirement for arbitrage out there. That's why arbitrage opportunities happen and they disappear very, very quickly because, you know, after all, we're not, uh, uh, we're not uh, willing to lose money uh, every time systematically. All right, so how are we gonna do this replication? All right, so read that second green teardrop point. The values of the option and the underlying asset, in this case, a share stock, can be used to create a risk-free portfolio. Recall in one of those earlier learning modules, I said, get out your phone and take a picture. And there was, I don't know, three or four different types of replication where you could replicate the ownership of a share of stock and a call option and, uh, and a risk-free security. So that's all we're going to do here. But in particular, look at that third teardrop point. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and write an option. And then we're going to buy some shares of that underlying stock. Now you might be tempted to say, okay, if I write one option, then I'm going to buy one share of stock, right? One option and one share of stock. Those should offset each other and we can, well, let's go back up to that second green teardrop point. We can use that position. And by the way, we're gonna call that a hedged position to create a risk-free portfolio. Hmm. So all we're gonna to have to do here to apply all the replication stuff and all the no arbitrage stuff that we've learned in the previous modules to the binomial model is say something like, hey, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sell one call option and we're gonna buy H, look at that third teardrop point, H units of that underlying share of stock. So let me just repeat this. You're tempted to say one option and one share stock, but that is not going, to, and you can do that by the way, but that is not going to give you a risk-free payoff. So that's why that H is in italics in that third teardrop point to emphasize that we're gonna buy, I'm sorry, we're gonna write one option and we're gonna own a fraction of the shares of stock, maybe 0.5, maybe 0.25, maybe 0.75. But notice what we did in the illustration down here in the gray box. All we're doing is we're going to add the notation H to all the stuff that we did in those previous slide slides. So the value today is the hedge, the H, uh, the hedge ratio times the stock spot price today, that stock price today minus the call price today. And then we're going to skip ahead to the expiration date and we're just going to throw that same H in there. Now, what we need to do is we need to solve for H so that, and let me go back here, that the value one, value sub one for both the up movement and the down movement are equal. And that should make perfect sense because that's what a risk-free portfolio means, that it doesn't matter what prices do, it doesn't matter what interest rates do, it doesn't matter what anything does, that we have locked into a future value of our portfolio. So, if we do a little bit of algebra, and by the way, this is this H is known as the hedge ratio, and you can you can go pretty easily from that first double arrow point to the solution in the blue box with just some simple algebra. But I can assure you that in the academic literature, solving for the hedge ratio is the result of some pretty cool calculus. But here it's just super simplified. So notice what we're going to do. This hedge ratio has a numerator and the hedge ratio has a denominator. And these are super easy. All we're going to do in the numerator is take the difference between the call price during the up move and the call price during the down move. Let me go back here. Where was I? Right here. So look at C sub 1 up and C sub 1 down. All we're going to do is, and let me quickly go back here, we're going to take the difference between those two, put that in the numerator, and then take the difference between the two possible stock prices and put that in the denominator. So this is going to be called our hedge ratio. So let me read that. What is that? The third diamond point. It's the proportion of the underlying share of stock that will offset the risk associated with writing the option. You know, so this is called the hedge ratio. Remember what I've said to you multiple times that when we're hedging, we're essentially betting against ourselves. 
So think about this. If you have a position in an underlying asset, you might have this much of variability, right? But when you, when you hedge, you're just narrowing that variability. Sometimes you narrow it to here, sometimes to here, sometimes to here. Sometimes you completely eliminate risk. But what we're doing here is we're narrowing it all the way down to locking into a risk-free rate of interest. So quickly look at the example down at the bottom. A hedge ratio of 0.5 means that for every call option that we write, we're going to buy 0.5 units of the underlying. Now, of course, you can't, you can't trade in fractions of shares. So just say something like, hey, a hedge ratio of 0.5 means that for every two options that we write, we're going to buy one share of that underlying stock. Feel free to take a pause and say, hey, you know what, Jim? Uh, this is not too difficult. All right, so we in that last slide or two, we did the replication part of this requirement. Now let's go ahead and talk about the arbitrage point of this requirement. And so all we're doing is very simply saying that the value uh, of this portfolio, right? The portfolio of the writing the share stock and owning owning that share stock has to be equilibrated. There's a word that I like to use, but I'm not sure if it's actually a word by the risk free rate of interest. So that's why we have in the middle there value today has to be equal to the present value tomorrow or one one period from today. And then all we do is substitute uh, the hedge ratio in there to get what we see in the blue box down at the bottom. So the value of the call option today is going to be the hedge ratio times the spot price today or that stock price today minus the value of that hedged portfolio. Now, of course, seeing some simple math example is going to bring all of these models to life. So let's go ahead and look at this here. We have a one year call option, a non-dividend paying stock. Now that's interesting only from the perspective that dividends just uh, complexify the model just a little bit. We'll consider dividends uh, in level two when we do the Black-Scholes Merton option pricing model. But for now, you probably could expect to read that in the question stem, non-dividend paying stock. All right, current price is $80. The call option has an exercise price of 85. So this is an out of the money option, right? We have the right to buy at 85. Why would we buy at 85 when we can go to the New York Stock Exchange and buy at 80? So this option has no intrinsic value, but what we're gonna try to do is figure out what is the time value of this option. There we go, risk-free rate of 4%. The stock is expected to go up or down by 30%. So there's that R superscript U and the R super uh, sub uh, superscript D based on one plus the decimal form of that 30%. All right, so this is gonna be super, super easy. So let's go ahead and do our binomial stuff. We're always gonna start over on the left-hand side and say, hey, what is the current stock price today? and that's $80. So we're going to draw a green arrow going upward and a red arrow going downward. That gross return is one plus the decimal form. So one plus 0.3, that gets us 1.3. Take the 1.3 times the $80 and that gives us, well, look over there on the far upper right, that gives us 104. So we're saying in this binomial model that the stock price today is $80 and if the price goes up, it's gonna go up to 104. And then alternatively, if the price goes down, we're gonna multiply by one minus that 30%. So there's the 0.7, right? Gross returns, 0.7. <clears throat> so 70% of $80 is $56. So clearly this is not too difficult, right? We learned this in kindergarten. What did we learn in kindergarten? We learned how to add, we learned how to subtract, and then at the end, we learned how to multiply. So all we're doing is taking 80 times 1.3, 80 times 0.7. But now we have to realize that there's a call option written on this share of stock with an exercise price of $85. So let's go ahead and skip to the expiration of this option. If the stock price goes up, which means we're assuming that the stock price is gonna be 104. Well, we now have the right to buy at 85. 
when the price is 104. Boy, this is a good deal, right? This is an option that is finishing in the money. Now it has no time value at expiration, but this option, if the price goes up, is gonna have $19 worth of intrinsic value. So everybody see this, this is the key. Price goes up to 104, stock price goes up to 104, therefore the call is worth $19. Now remember, that's $19 one year from today. Let's repeat that process if the price goes down. So if the stock price goes down by 30%, it'll fall from 80 to 56. Well, what does that mean? We have the right to buy at 85. Why would we buy at 85 when we can go to the New York Stock Exchange and only pay $56? So this is an out of the money option. So of course the value, both time and intrinsic value of this call option is zero. Ah, so that should be super easy, right? We learned this in kindergarten. So you ought to be able to do the 104, the 19, the 56 and the zero. Super easy calculations. Now note that that's all based on, let me go back here in the question stem, that's all based on if the stock price is expected to go up or down by 30%. Now on the exam, don't expect to have the up by 30 equal the down by 30. In my first example, I had the up, what was it, a 110 and down to 90, so that was 10%. They don't have to be equal. They can be different. You can go up by 30% and down by 20%. I mean, you can have any combination there. So don't be upset if on the exam you get 20% and 18%. All right, so let's go ahead and compute the hedge ratio. All we're gonna do is simple math. We're gonna take in the numerator the difference between 19 and zero, right? The call price during the up movement and the call price during the down movement at expiration, 19 minus zero. And then in the denominator, we're just gonna take the difference between the two possible stock prices, 104 minus 56. So that gets us almost uh, almost to 0.4. And by the way, the example in, uh, in the learning module comes up with an exact hedge ratio of 0.4. All right, so all we've done so far is we've calculated those future possibilities for both the stock and the call, and now we've calculated the hedge ratio. All right, so what does that mean? That for every call option that we write, we're gonna buy 0.39583 shares of stock. So let's go ahead and do these calculations. These are simple calculations. All we're gonna do is take the 0.39583. Notice that it'll be so much easier, and I'm guessing the Institute will do this on the exam. They'll craft a problem so that the hedge ratio comes out to be 0.4 or 0.3 or 0.45 or some, uh, some number that doesn't have lots and lots of significant digits. But of course, we like to make sure that when we do these problems that you're careful to all the attention of the details. So all we're gonna do is take the hedge ratio times 104, take the hedge ratio times the 56, right? Those two possible stock prices, subtract out the intrinsic value of the hedge ratio. And notice we get the same answer, 2217 and 2217. And then, now remember that's value at time period one. So we just discount that at that 4% rate. Let me go back here. So we're given a risk-free rate of interest of 4%. So discount that back to get the 2132. And then we'll use that final equation on that previous slide. We'll just, uh, we'll take the hedge ratio times the stock price of $80, so 39583 times 80, subtract out the value of that hedged portfolio, which we just computed as 2132, and that gets us the price of the call option, $10.35. Wow, so that's a lot of stuff. What did I say to you earlier? This is kind of the long way to do it, and the long way is based on replication, it's based on uh, no arbitrage condition, and it's based on the simple fact that we're gonna use the risk-free rate of interest to compute the price. So note that that 1038 is really a present value. It's kind of like the difference between uh, the stock price, which is a present value, by the way. Remember, we used that Myron Gordon growth model minus the V sub zero, which you should know is a present value as well. So the reason that I like this long way is because it emphasizes the importance 
of the hedge ratio, that 0.39583, and replication, and no arbitrage pricing to compute the value of this derivative security. So let's go back and read that LOS together. Explain how to value a derivative. So here we're valuing a call option using the one period binomial model. Boy, super simple stuff. Now, how about if we do this just quickly with the put option? Um, I will say this, the learning module does not include this valuation model in the body of the document, but it does very quickly in one of those knowledge checks. So I'm just going to say to you what I've said to you regularly when you think about a put option. All right, so we, we know everything about the call option in the binomial model. So to apply that to a put option, I do this regularly, just turn it upside down. So everything holds true based on what we've decided. But go ahead and look for the P sub 1 with the superscript U and the superscript D, it's just upside down, right? Instead of taking the difference between the stock price and the exercise price, now we take the difference between the exercise price and the stock price. And so everything else holds true. The hedge ratio looks the same, the value looks the same, and so we can just do a, a quick example here. One year put option, hey, there's the non-dividend paying stock I was telling you about earlier, exercise price 50, stock price of 45, uh, up or down by 20%, risk-free rate 4%. So we can just quickly go through all of the math, but remember now that uh, when the stock price goes up, the put option will be out of the money. So notice P sub one super subscript U, there's that zero over there in the blue. And then down below when the stock price falls, of course, when we own the put option, we benefit during falling prices. So that's 14. So you do all that stuff and then you can do all this stuff here and you get $5.38. So my advice is to go ahead and pause the video and just do the math here, get your calculator out quickly, just to verify that you can do this on the exam. So that's the long way. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and do what I think is a little bit of a shortcut. And I like this model. In fact, most of the questions that I ask my students are based on this risk neutral probability. Now, I want to call your attention to this term, risk neutral probability. The, the word and the term is a little bit misleading. It's, it's almost like it sounds like, oh, you're neutral to risk. And that's probably not too terribly true in the whole context of what we learned from Harry Markowitz and William Sharp and Stephen Ross and what you guys will learn from Black, Scholes and Merton. But the risk neutral probability is really just a way for uh, the academic world to attack the idea that we want to focus on returns. Now we know, we know from our conversations about uh, distribution of returns. The first moment of the distribution is return. The second moment of the distribution <clears throat> is standard deviation. Third moment of the distribution is skewness. Fourth moment of the distribution is kurtosis. So we have all this extra stuff out there. But with risk neutral probabilities, what we're saying is that we're just focusing on the first moment of the distribution. We're focusing on it. It's almost like we don't care about those other three moments. And it sounds like the we don't care about those other moments implies that we're kind of naive or maybe ignorant, but that's, that's really not true. What we're going to do is we're going to call this a risk neutral probability and somewhere impacted in these risk neutral probabilities, we're going to come up with a reasonable value of, of this option. So let's read through some of these diamond points here. Options value is not affected by actual real world probabilities. We're going to, in effect, substitute risk neutral probabilities, and we're going to come up with something that's really super close, if not identical, to uh, the option value uh, on the floor of an exchange. 
Now, what we need are those gross returns, the R super U and the R super D. And notice in parentheses we've put, these are not expected returns. These are just gross returns based on some kind of a macro idea of what we think is going to happen to the path of stock prices. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a probability. So I want you to, I want you to look over on the far right. There's that little pi sign. So recall from that long method that we used earlier, and in fact, it said it on a slide, we didn't really need to worry about probabilities. Well, here in this second shortcut way, we're going to come up with these uh, probabilities, that sign for pi, and that's going to be our risk neutral probability. And this is a super simple equation. We're going to take one plus that risk free rate of interest, and then we're going to subtract the downward movement, those gross returns under a downward movement. And then in the denominator, we're just going to take the upward gross return minus the downward gross return. And you'll see that here in just a few seconds. So then what we can do is we can use that risk neutral probability to discount the, I want you to look in the brackets there over on the left hand side. What do we have? The call price during an upward movement and the call price during a downward movement. So we're using these risk neutral probabilities and then in the denominator, we're discounting them. So that equation there in the middle of the page, in the middle of the slide, is really a great illustration of how the call price is really a present value. Just like every other security that we've discussed, bonds, shares of stock, these are present values. So I like asking this question to my students because it is explicitly telling us that the call price is a present value. Now, back here, we did present, let me go back to the, uh, let me go back to the call. Where was that example? Yeah, here are these two things. Here we computed the hedge ratio and then we computed present values and then we took some differences in there. So implied in this gray box, of course, are present values, but here, make sure I don't go too far. But here, here you actually see it in the final equation. So let's go ahead and uh, look at an example. And let's go ahead and look at the example that we did earlier on. So we have this call, price, call option, current price of the stock $80, exercise price 85, risk-free rate of interest four, up or down by 30%. And now, now instead of using that long method where we use the hedge ratio, we're going to use this risk neutral pricing model. So we need to do the same thing again. So look at the top part of this illustration in the gray box. There's our 104 and the 19. There's our 56 and the zero. But instead of computing the hedge ratio, we're going to compute the risk neutral probability. And this is of an upward move. So you just say 1.04 minus the 0.7, put that in the numerator, then 1.3 minus the 0.7, put that in the denominator, and there you get, you get a risk neutral probability of an upward move of 57%, which tells us that the risk neutral probability of a downward move has to be one minus that 57%, so that's 43%. So remember in that hedge ratio stuff that we did early on, we explicitly said, hey, we don't need to worry about any probabilities, but somewhere embedded in all that mathematics was this 57 and 43%. So now let's just use that 57. All right, you ready for this? So look up at the top. If the stock price goes from 80 to 104, the value of that call option is gonna be $19. Well, what does this risk neutral probability tell us? It tells us that we have a 57% of getting that 19%. So that's the first part of the numerator, 0.57 times 19. And of course we need to do a weighted average plus 43% times zero, because if the stock price falls, that option is going to be out of the money. Remember what I said earlier, that when the option is out of the money, it's going to really simplify things for us. So that plus 43% times zero, I mean, that is zero, right? So we don't need to really worry about that uh, over on the right hand side of the plus sign. Now remember the 19 and the zero, that's going to occur at the end of one period, so we need to discount it. So we divide by 1.04 using discrete compounding and look at what we get 
$10.35 for the price of that call option. So I'll let you guys decide whether you like the hedging model or the risk neutral model better. This one seems to me like it's a shortcut. The other one seems to me like it's a long cut, but rest assured that they both use the same kind of math, but the emphasis uh, is on two different approaches. Let me just repeat myself here. This approach is on risk neutral probabilities and present value. The long cut is based on that no arbitrage condition and replication and present value. Either way, you're going to get to 1035. Uh, either way, you ought to be prepared for both of these uh, on the exam. And then, of course, we can do this once again with the put option. Can I, do I need to do this again? We're just going to turn ourselves upside down like we're standing on our heads in the middle of our living room. And so there is the price of the put option with the risk neutral probabilities. And that takes us not only through module 10, but it takes us through all of the, all the fun stuff that we've been doing here for all of these 10 modules. Um, I want you to go to the end of this learning module. There are four really, really good and what I think are deep and clever uh, multiple choice questions that'll take you through uh, the one period binomial model. So thank you for watching. Good luck studying. Make sure you go to all of our practice problems and our um, mock exams so that you can master this topic of derivatives. Hey, thanks for watching. Have a great day.